me in your copy of God's Word to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. And we're going to be going through verses 2 and 4 today. Habakkuk 2, starting with verse 2. Kind of go back and just do a little bit of a warm-up, if you will. We're going through a series uh, through the book of Habakkuk. We're going verse by verse. And we're talking about faith in a fallen world. Uh, and I think that uh, most of us who are alive and who are coherent, have coherent thought, we can look around in our world today and we can go, wow, yeah, it takes a lot to have faith in the fallen world. It takes a lot to have faith today in the world that we live in, especially when we consider all that's going on. Just this past week, we had a mass shooting in Raleigh, North Carolina. The last I heard, there were five people dead, uh, multiple injured uh, aside from that. Uh, I did not know anybody from that, even though we're from that general area, but I did have uh, friends of mine from Oxford, North Carolina, who knew one of those who was killed. And I saw the devastation on their hearts uh, just through social media and things like that and the posts that were going on. I can't imagine what those people are going through today. And we need to remember them in our prayers. Uh, the world is not getting better. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, the, their world will tell you that we are evolving into something higher. We're evolving into something greater than we've ever been. I'll say this, I think technology is improving. I think we see science, uh, we're, we're learning more and more on the science end of things. Uh, there's a lot of things that seem to be getting better, but we're not evolving into anything greater. As a matter of fact, we're devolving, which the scriptures tell us that that's exactly what's going to happen. Amen. It says in the end times, in those days when Jesus is going to come back for his people, that things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And unfortunately, people around us are lost to this. We, we don't see it. Uh, they, they don't have these spiritual eyes to see, and so they look around and they think, this is just how things are. And it, it's terrible. It's awful that they're happening. Um, but, you know, it's just life. And, and we'll do something to change things. We'll do something to make it better. We'll put a law in, or we'll legislate something, or we'll change something in the wording of some document, and we'll get better. That is just not the case. The only way that we're going to get better is through Jesus Christ. And I would tell that to you today. I would tell people at Ruby Tuesday or anywhere else that I'm at that thinks that the world is going to get better apart from Jesus. There is no way that that's going to happen. Because without a foundation in Jesus, you don't really know what morality is. You don't really know what the truth is. You don't really know what's going to happen at the end. You see, a lot of people think everybody dies and goes to heaven. They've got that idea in their minds. And, oh, we'll all get there eventually in some way. The Bible tells us something totally different as well. It tells us that we must have a mediator. We must have someone to bridge that gap for us. And we're told that it is Jesus. Habakkuk is seeing evil in his day. Uh, God has allowed him to see what, what they called an oracle. He's, he's been able to see this vision of what's happening and what is to come. And he's seeing all of this evil. And what it does for him is it makes him question God. I'll say this is probably the question. If we could really put it into a question that applies to today. If God is really who he says he is in his word, if he is so good then why does he allow evil to happen? The odds are is that most everyone in this room has asked that question to themselves, wondered it aloud or uh, you know, in your own mind or your heart. You've wondered if God is this great God, then why does he allow things like this to happen? Uh, I'll just say this. God has given us a choice. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. He put them in a perfect situation where they needed nothing. And yet Satan came along and tempted them and they fell to that temptation and decided to do something else because they believed that God was holding something back from them. They wanted to be in charge. 
like God is. And we continue to be that way today. And last week, as we uh, were dealing with Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verse 12 through chapter 2, verse 1, we see that Habakkuk is dealing with this, and he's, he's trying to figure all this out in his own mind, in his own heart. Why is this happening? Why is he going to let the Babylonian army come in and you know, tear apart things and, 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 and do these dreaded things? And so he begins to work through this process of problem solving. And last week I gave you some steps. If you're wondering what is going on with God or where is God or why is this happening in my life, there's some steps that you can take. First, think through the issue. You think through the issue. Uh, you, you think you got you to gotta spend some time and think about it. Then you restate what you know. What did Habakkuk restate? That God is sovereign. That God is holy. He's righteous. He's good. He's faithful. So he began to restate these things that he already knows because he knows what God has done in the past. He even knows what he's done in his own life, in his own heart. Then he applies what he knows to the problem. Well, God is in charge. God is holy. God is righteous. So these things must work out in the end. I don't quite understand it. So because you don't quite understand it, then the next step is you ask God to help you understand. Why did, why did this thing in Raleigh, North Carolina happen this past week? Ask God to help you understand it. It's because people have turned away from God. Or they've never looked to him in the first place. They're denying his existence because if they acknowledged his existence and followed his way, then this shooter, this person who uh, put all this devastation in the lives of these families, he would have understood that the only person who really deserves to be able to give and take away life is God himself. So we ask God to help us to understand. And then next, wait for God's answer. We are so driven by speed today. We want things in an instant. I can pull out my phone or my iPad that I've got in front of me. I can put something in a search bar and I can find millions of results in seconds. Why? Because that's what we want. We want everything at our fingertips. And yet when we call out to God many times, we don't get an answer like that. We don't get millions of answers. We don't even get one sometimes for much time. We have to be patient. We have to wait for God's answer. And so we see that in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. He says that he is going to go up into his tower and he is going to wait for God's answer. So now we're in verses 2 through 4, um, and, and I think this includes probably one of the greatest statements in Scripture, and we'll see that this statement is actually used by multiple New Testament uh, writers and in New Testament books as well. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4, let's read them. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. So as we look at those uh, first little bit there, write the vision. God is saying, write it down. I want other people to be able to see what happens? I want other people to be able to read what I've said and what I've done. And guess what? That's exactly what we're doing here thousands of years later. We're still talking about the vision that God gave Habakkuk for his time and also, I believe, for our time. So he says, write it down. Make it plain. I, I like this one because um, I, 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 immediately what came to my mind was my wife's handwriting. Horrible horrible she's in the medical field somehow she's adopted this doctor's handwriting 
Um, her, her signature, you might be able to make out the I and the B, and the rest of it's like a little squiggly line with a little tail off to the end of it. That, that's it. When she writes things down, she has to first ask me, because she's giving me a grocery list or something, she has to ask me to read it. Make sure you can understand what I'm saying first before you leave here. I'm like, what is that right there? Oh, well, that's, you know, vegetables or you know, whatever it is. Uh, terrible handwriting. So what is God telling Habakkuk? You, you don't just write it down, but you, you need to make it legible. You need to make it clear. We don't need any mistakes going on here. We don't need there to be any ambiguity in it. We don't need people to look at it and kind of squint their eyes wondering what it's saying. No, we want to make it clear so people can take this and run with it. They go, man, this is God's word. But then he goes on and says, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. So what is he saying? This ain't happening overnight. Sit back and wait. Wait on me. Give it time. Don't worry. If I said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You know, we just had communion recently. And one of the things about communion is not only recognizing what he has done for us in shedding his blood and, and his body being broken on our behalf, but it also says, and do this until he comes again. Remembering when, that he is coming a second time. But how long have, been people, have people been waiting for that return? <laughs> Ever since he first said it. In scripture, everybody's like, when is he coming? Man, I wish I knew. We, we've got thousands upon thousands of books of people writing because they think they know when Jesus is returning. And it's going to happen in my generation. I mean, Billy Graham thought it was going to happen in his generation. John Hagee thinks it's going to happen in his generation. But every generation before those guys, they all thought it was going to happen in their generation too. It hasn't happened yet. But he says in his word, hold on. Be patient. There's one thing that we do know. Even if I don't get to see Jesus return to earth, when my life is over, I get to return to him. <laughs> I'm good either way. If you're in Christ, you should be like, hey, whether he comes today or whether he comes in a thousand years, if I got faith in Jesus, I'm okay. I'm excited because I know what's ahead. He says, if it seems slow, wait for it. How many of you are going through struggles right now? I can imagine we, we just talked about, uh, Rudy just mentioned a couple of different people right now. Wanda Cutshaw and Joe Rhodes and the issues that they're going on. And I, I can imagine there's this impatience that goes on when you're the family. And when even when you're the person who's, who's hurt and struggling in that moment, you're, you're constantly waiting for something like, God, bring me out of this. I'm, I want to I wanna move out. I don't want to be in this pain. I don't want to be in in this struggle God says be patient be patient I've got a plan doesn't match yours but I've got a plan and I can assure you that one day it's going to come to pass and look for somebody like Joe Rhodes we love him dearly God says that he'll heal him and that's either going to be on this side of eternity or on the next. We've just got to be patient. See what God does. So what was Habakkuk being asked to do? You've got an outline in your bulletin if you haven't already pulled that out and, and, and got a pencil or pen or something. But you've got an outline there. What was Habakkuk being asked to do by God? I think he was being asked to do two different things. Believe what hasn't happened. Now that's hard for us, that's hard for us to believe what hasn't happened yet. God's given Habakkuk a vision, he's told him what's going to happen, he's telling him, hey, this is what's going to end up, this is the way it's going to end up. So he's being asked to believe what hasn't happened. That's what faith is, by the way. In a sense, 
It's believing what hasn't happened, but it's also believing what we don't understand. Now, we might understand parts of it, but we don't understand the, the big picture. We don't know every bit of the details, but we're being asked what we, uh, to believe what we can't see. How many of you have seen God? Not a single one of us has seen God face to face. Have there been people that have seen God? Well, Jesus made the statement that if you've seen Him, then you've seen the Father. But how many of us were alive to see Jesus in the flesh? Not a single one of us. So we don't even have that option. We know that Moses saw the backside of God and it was so glorious and holy and bright that he had to put a veil over his head just to keep that, that brightness down because it, nobody else could look at him. And that was just the backside of God. But none of us have seen God. But he tells us that one day we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven if we respond in faith to Jesus Christ. So we must believe what we can't see, and that's not on your list. Believe what hasn't happened, and believe what we don't understand. I want to give us a few verses here. I want to read these out loud. We're going to, if you can't tell, we're going to keep moving today. Got a lot going on today, so I'm going to keep moving. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Where in the world did the writer of Romans get this from? Habakkuk. He's directly quoting the verses that we're dealing with today. You see, a lot of people today try to disconnect the Old Testament from the New Testament and vice versa. Uh, there's one guy who was known for making a statement, you know, unhitching from the Old Testament. No, you can't unhitch from the Old Testament because both are tied together. If I'm preaching in the New Testament, I tie you to the Old Testament and show you where God said that this was going to happen. If I'm preaching from the Old Testament, I'm going to send you to the New Testament to show you where they believed it was going to happen as well. And that's exactly what we see here. As we see this continuity through Scripture with the righteous shall live by faith. Galatians 3 is this. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by by faith. Once again, no one is justified before God by the law. That's where it starts. There was somebody, I, I saw a comment um, in one of our pastor's forums that we have. This guy had this couple show up to his church recently, and they began attending regularly, and then they uh, came to him or went to him and said, we would love to join this church. We're at baptized believers, so forth and so on. He said, well, I'd love to sit down with you and talk with you about this step that you're wanting to take. And so they sat down and had a conversation. And the more the conversation went on, the more he realized that these people who claim to be Christians also claim to keep the law, meaning the Jewish law. He said, well, do you have a Jewish background? Well, no. Where did this thing come from? Well, we believe that we need to be Christian, but we need to hold on to the law as well. He said, you do realize that uh, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We know that. But when he came, he changed some things. Some things that used to be were no more. We know that Jesus opened the eyes of the people at that time and told them, hey, you can eat pork. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Jews, the Jews wouldn't eat pork. Man, I am so glad to have some country ham with my eggs in the morning. How about you, Michael? What do you think? I'm telling you what, it was good that things changed in the New Testament. Jesus came and said, I have fulfilled the law because you can't. Because I can't. And yet these people are still trying to hold on to the law. He said the more he talked to them about this, the more they believed that they were being justified by holding on to the law. He says, you've missed the point. You're not justified by keeping the law. You're justified by the blood of Jesus. You're justified by his death 
on a cross. He gave it all up for you. Let's read another one. Hebrews 10, 37 through 38 says, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Once again, my righteous one shall live by faith. Constantly, over and over and over again. And these are just a few of the options that I could have pointed out today. Over and over again, it says the righteous shall live by faith. You are justified by faith. You can't do anything to earn salvation. Not a single thing. You may leave out of here today. uh, You may finish up with the service and you may go to lunch. And then you may go to the grocery store. And you may uh, buy somebody else's groceries and you feel good about it. And they feel good about it. And and you think, man, I've done some good stuff today. But I'm here to tell you, you're not half an inch closer to salvation than you were when you started. Because it's not about doing those good things. It's about Jesus. Now, when you have Jesus, you'll do good things. That's where we get it mixed up. No, when you got Jesus, yeah, you'll do good things for others. You will love others in uh, many different ways. But it says, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So don't shrink back. You may be in here today, and you're a person of faith, but you've gotten over your salvation. It's been 20, 30 years, 15 years. It could be five years ago. It could be two years ago. And yet you've gotten over your salvation. You're nowhere near as excited as you were on the first day when you found Christ. Don't shrink back. He's not moved. He's not gone anywhere. He's still right where he was from the very beginning. And he wants you to have an active loving relationship with him and the only way to do that is by devoting yourself to those things that he wants you to devote yourself to and that's first to love jesus how do you fix the issues in the world today you start by loving jesus at the end of this life when you're face to face with god in heaven the only thing that's going to matter is what you did with Jesus that's it I believe he's going to ask that question did you love my son did you place my faith place your faith in him so we got two quick points we're going to go through Uh, that was just kind of a preliminary thing here Um, but these are not going to take that long because it's very clear Um, I wanted to give you two points righteousness comes through faith Righteousness comes through faith. There are many examples of this, but I'm going to give you one from the Old Testament because I love using Old Testament examples of people that were looking forward to a Savior. They were looking forward to a Messiah. They had placed their faith in God and and placed their faith that this Messiah was to come. Genesis 15, 6 says, And he, who is Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Why are we talking about Abraham today? It's because God counted his faith to him as righteousness. He had faith in the Messiah who was to come. And when Jesus came and he died on that cross, he was resurrected on the third day. uh, Abraham's faith became sight. Praise the Lord. But righteousness, uh, righteousness comes through faith, but so does Justification. Justification comes through faith. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to have peace with God? You find it through Jesus. There's a lot of people today, they're searching. They really are. There's a lot of people today that say, oh, well, people are not looking for God. People are not interested in God. People are not searching for God. I I think that's a lie. I think that people are looking for God. The problem is, is they're looking for him in all the wrong places. I believe that was an old country song, wasn't it, Rick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Change the word Jesus. 
Looking for Jesus in all the wrong place. No, I'm, this, let me, let me, I better move on. The only way that we have peace with God is through Jesus Christ himself. That's it. As a matter of fact, the only way that you can have peace with yourself is through Jesus Christ. So there are a lot of people today who are carrying around the guilt, the pain, and the shame of past mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've shared many of them with you. I'm kind of an open book when it comes to that. I'm no perfect person standing up in front of you trying to tell you how to be like me. No, I am far from being perfect and I've made every mistake that I could possibly make. But there's one thing that I don't have today that I did have before Jesus. I don't have any regret. There's no shame hanging over my head. Now, do I wish I wouldn't have done some things? Absolutely, of course. I think all of us are like that. But I no longer harbor that regret and that shame in my heart the way I did before. I wanted to get rid of it to the point of where I was ready to take my own life because I thought that there was no way to get rid of it. Thank God he kept me around long enough to be able to find Jesus. So if you want peace with God, Find it today through Jesus Christ. I want to finish by reading a parable out of Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, because I think this is very important and very pertinent to the conversation today. It says this, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. First, I want to stop and ask a question. Do you know anybody right now? You, you, you could probably think of somebody. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe it's some, a friend, a family member, or somebody else that you know. Do you know anybody right now who's got trust in themselves and they believe that they're righteous and treat others with contempt because they are so good? Do you, do you got anybody you know like that? Don't point at your spouse. But do you know anybody like that? Or have you ever known anybody like that? They walk around as if they're the greatest thing that God's given since a fry bologna sandwich. I mean, they think, that, my wife's like, ew, you could have used a better example. Um, but but they, they walk around thinking that they're good. They're righteous. They've got it all together. I, I've got this thing down. And because they think they're so high, they treat others with contempt. That's the only logical thing that's going to happen anyway. When you puff yourself up so high, you start floating above everyone else. That's what happens. The more you build yourself up, the less everybody else becomes. Jesus says that what we should be doing is humbling ourselves to the point where the only person we can look up to is Jesus. Because the rest of us have our face in the dirt begging for mercy. Wow. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You could tie this in to the two men on the cross with Jesus and put it like this. One guy was fine in his sin and everything else, and he took whatever it was, and he was, he was just good with it. And the other one humbled himself and said, this man does not deserve to be here. And then he turns around and he looks at Jesus and says, hey, can I be with you? Can I go? I, I, he believed in him. He placed his faith in him. And what did Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. The difference was, is one 
was puffed up and conceited and prideful, and the other one was humbled in the face of God himself. In this parable, we see the Pharisee who's standing by himself. And look, if you're ever to this point, or if you're ever in a room of people, uh, say you go to an old class reunion, you go to something where people that you know are gathered together, and if the thing you're thinking in that moment is, wow, I'm glad I'm not like the rest of these people. You're the Pharisee. And I can assure you that God is not pleased. But if you're the tax collector, which by the way, no one liked the tax collector. No one likes the tax collector today. The government just hired 87,000 of them, I think it was. I'm not going to like them either. I don't like the ones they got currently. I'm not going to like the new ones. I just don't like tax collectors because they're taking my money. I don't want my money taken. Uh, but in this day, they weren't just taking their mon your money uh, as a government thing. They were also, most of them, were taking additional money to pad their own pockets. So they were called, considered the center of all sinners to the people that they were taking their money from. Yet, in this parable, we see that Jesus himself uses the tax collector and says he can't even look up because he realizes how poor and pitiful he is. He can't, he can't even look up. The Pharisee is standing up there, I mean, chest out, bowed out. He's thinking he's the stuff, but the tax collector is like, I, I can't even lift my eyes to heaven. But he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice that the Pharisee didn't need God because he had become a God to himself. The tax collector knew that he was not God and turned his heart and his focus to him. And what does he say? I tell you, this man, this tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Listen, there's a lot of people today who think they've got it all together. They, they think they've got it. They've built up a, an empire of their own. They've got their own kingdom. They, they, they're standing in all of their wealth. And they think, hey, I, I've, I've got it great. I did this. I'm a self-made man or woman, whatever it may be. They're standing up there like that. And they're so puffed up. But when this life is over, and they're standing before a holy God, if they're without faith, here's what's going to happen. He's going to look at them and say, I'm sorry for I never knew you. And he's going to cast them into the outer darkness apart from God forever. So the one who was puffed up has been humbled by a holy God. But the one who shows up at heaven's gates and he says, I don't deserve to be here. He says, you know what? You're absolutely right. You don't. But because of Jesus... You are. That's the difference. What was Habakkuk saying? What was God saying to Habakkuk? Hey, believe. Believe. Place your faith in me. Wait, it's going to happen. Don't worry. I've got this under control. And if you will continue and place that faith in me and keep that faith up, I will elevate you in the day that is to come. If you're here today, and we're going to have our uh, pianist and Ivy come up. Uh, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Him, you have an opportunity to do that right now. Uh, you can come down and find me at the front, and I'd be willing to pray with you or read Scripture together if you want to find me after the service, after the meal, whatever it is. Please do that. Stand with us as we sing. He knows my name, and I pray that that's the case with you today.